It's the Forever night thon We're recapping and reviewing every single episode of Season 1 of the 1990s Canadian Police Procedural about a vampire detective taking a bite out of crime. Hey, just real quick, content warning, this episode deals with sexual assault and abuse, so if that's something that's uh, going to affect you, maybe give this one a skip. Episode 11, Dead Issue, opens with a couple of sex havers going into a room to do their dirty, filthy deeds. But they're not satisfied simply having sex. No, she wants to go even further, to watch a videotape. Disgusting. But the guy heard of a new thing from a friend that he wants to try. Uh, he wants to choke her during sex, which is this new thing he just heard about. Not in a cool way, in a, in a very upsetting way, uh, where he d keeps going after she explicitly tells him to stop. We see her defend herself, and then soon, the man is dead. She confesses to the police feeling guilty about his death, and it seems like a slam-dunk case of self-defense. Turns out, she's also the wife of a police captain and friends with Stone Tree, who's taking all of this pretty personally. Nick, though, something about this doesn't seem right to him. There's just something fishy, and he digs a little deeper. He is told, in no uncertain terms, by Stone Tree, among others, that he is not to investigate this anymore. Skanky is especially insistent, so... We, the viewer, know that this is the dumb, wrong position. And let me tell you, Skanky is in rare form today. Well, 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 if it isn't Artie, the fascinating forensic. It's Arthur, Officer Shank. That's Detective Skanky Arthur. Nice tie. When he did that, I thought, oh, I guess they're introducing this forensic guy. He must be important in the story later. Nope. Skanky is just a dick to this random dude, for no reason. Seeing Mrs. Fury look so guilty and blame herself triggers a memory for Nick, where he posed with a model for a master painter back in olden times. The woman he's posing with asks him to kill her, feeling deeply ashamed of being, in her words, a seductress. Nick asks her what she means and finds out that she thinks this because she was sexually assaulted by the painter, and essentially gaslit into believing that it was her fault. Nick tries to get her to stop blaming herself, but she ends up drinking poison. Her rapist scoffs and complains that now he'll have to pay to bury her. Justice is not served. He gets away with it and is not remorseful whatsoever. This is not the setup for our hero taking a righteous revenge on him. This isn't even about Nick, really. He's just witness to a tragedy that he was powerless to prevent. In 1992, Nick investigates the videotape, leading him back to, a, I guess, a, a porno store uh, with some cartoon bad guys working there. This man, who literally has a lizard dangling from him like a Ninja Turtles villain, claims that Mrs. Fury just, I don't know, found that tape in a parking lot or something somewhere, and she returned it to him like a good Samaritan. Nick finds that somewhat difficult to believe, because it's a very obvious lie. Nobody would find a porno on the ground and take it upon themselves to do that. That's ridiculous. Nick goes to her home and spies on Mrs. Fury and her husband, who is extremely abusive towards her. If you just thought about me before you indulged your abnormal, contemptible appetites. When she gives her statement on the record, Nick realizes she couldn't have shot the guy, whose name is Gubbins. I've I've been putting off talking about that because like there's there's so much heavy stuff in this episode, but that the guy she killed is named Gubbins. And they keep saying gubbins in the middle of all this really heavy stuff. And it, it's just, it's hard. This, this is a hard one. Anyway, from the angle of the bullets, it'd need to be somebody taller than Mrs. Fury. He goes to talk to Jeanette at her nightclub, which is, I think, for the first time revealed to be named The Raven, to ask if she knows anything about gubbins. And I always thought that Jeanette's nightclub was like, just for vampires, right? It was a club specifically for vampires to go to and let loose and, and have fun. But I guess anyone evil is welcome there because both Gubbins and Lizard Man are apparently frequent patrons. Under interrogation, Skanky gets the Lizard Man to confirm that Mr. Fury threatened him into telling his silly lie. Stone Tree storms off angrily to confront his friend, and Skanky asks Nick what to do because he doesn't want to storm in if they're just talking peacefully. What should I do, Nick? Nick says, I don't know, I call him? So the phone rings at Mr. Fury's house and Stone Tree answers it and gets clubbed from behind. And also, quick question here, why did he answer the phone? This isn't his house. He would not do that. Mrs. Fury saves the day by revealing Stone Tree's location, finally managing to break her husband's abusive grip over her, and Nick manages to catch Mr. Fury before he off Stone Tree. Don't know what, don't know what his plan was, because uh, he's a police captain. He should know that like, even if he did kill Stone Tree, they, someone would have written down 
everything Stone Tree knew. Like, he wasn't going to get away. The episode ends with Nick somberly noting that as many changes as he's seen over the years for women, things haven't changed as much as people like to think. I did not expect this episode to be as thoughtful as it was. I have complained many times now about how Forever Night writes women as wicked temptresses who lead men to vice and ruin. This episode, refreshingly, does the opposite. It confronts the effects of this cultural narrative head on. It looks at how women are often blamed for the crimes committed against them, how they can even come to assume that blame themselves. Trapped in a deeply patriarchal society, the model can't process her trauma as anything other than the result of her own sinful nature. It has to be her fault, because if it isn't, then there's nothing that can be done about it. She'd never get justice, she'd never be believed, so she blames herself, as she has been conditioned to do. Likewise, Mrs. Fury blames herself for Gubbins' death when her husband was the one doing it, rationalizing it away because he wouldn't have been there if it weren't for her. And there's no easy answer here. Nick doesn't get to swoop in and save the day. I mean, he, do he does do that. He, he saves Stone Tree, yes, but the, that doesn't magically fix the problem. The model still dies, and Mrs. Fury is left traumatized. And it goes against TV conventions by specifically reminding us that there's no closure here. She'll have to live with this, and it's going to eat at her. And it is pointedly not fair. These are the type of things I didn't expect to be talking about when I decided to do a silly little series about my favorite vampire cop show. And I'd like to thank the people who will forever be my knights over at patreon.com slash scaredycats. In particular, I'd like to thank Verbena, Cooper Holmes, Joe McClory, Liz Widow, Mastin Ginger, James Garford, C.H. Phillips, Gideon, Charlotte Hollingsworth, Devin Kaler, Spooky Heather Sylvia, and definitely Todd. And I, Bobby Duke, the star of the channel, would like to thank the following people who is also the stars of the channel on account of their support on patreon.com slash scarycats. We got Jay Torney, Shaden Fraulein, Lanston Teen, Rachel Rat, Kato Moore, Carpad, Josh Manez, Hyla Tracy, Louisa Preto, and Jesse. Well, can you believe the shenanigans Nick Knight and his pals got up to in this one? Hey, we're gonna keep going all January, baby. You wanna get these videos a day oily? Go on over to Patreon. Oh, you know, wait. You know, you can just wait. I mean, how bad do you need it, you know? <laughs>